Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's briefing, which is uh, taking place a little bit later than normal. Um, I want to start, as I always do, by updating you on some of the key statistics in relation to COVID-19. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been a total of 13,486 positive cases confirmed, which is an increase of 181 since yesterday. A total of 1,484 patients are currently in hospital with either confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That is a decrease of 101 since yesterday. A total of 82 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected cases of the virus, and that is a decrease of seven since yesterday. I'm also able to confirm today that since the 5th of March, a total of 3,100 patients who had tested positive and been hospitalised with the virus have now been able to leave hospital. That is very good news and I wish all of them well. Unfortunately, however, I also have to report that in the past 24 hours, 10 deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed through a test as having the virus. And that takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 1,857. Uh, these figures uh, should, of course, be treated with some caution. Um, as we said before, although deaths can now be registered at weekends, we know that registration numbers over weekends are usually uh, lower than they are during the week. So that should be taken into account when considering today's figures. As always, I want to stress that these numbers are, are not just statistics, they represent individuals whose loss is being felt and mourned by many. And as always, I send my deepest condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one uh, to this virus. Uh, we are all thinking of you at this time. And I also want to thank, as I always do, our health and care workers. You are continuing to do extraordinary work in very challenging circumstances and there is not a day passes uh, that I don't feel and, I, and we all feel a, a deep debt of gratitude to you. Now I have one issue that I want to talk about today and that relates to lockdown. Uh, let me emphasise at the outset that the lockdown in Scotland remains in place. As I have set out before, the rate of transmission of the virus in Scotland, the R number that you have become used to hearing us talk about, is still too high for any significant change to be safe at this stage. Indeed, the R number may, as I said earlier in the week, be slightly higher here than in other parts of the UK at this point. That means we must be very cautious and very careful about where we proceed uh, to from here. Having made real progress in recent weeks, and I think you can tell from the figures that I am setting out for you day after day, that we have made real progress. The objective now for all of us must be to consolidate and solidify that progress. We mustn't squander our progress by easing up too soon or by sending mixed messages that result in people thinking that it's OK to ease up now. Let me be very blunt about the consequences if we were to do that. People will die unnecessarily. And instead of being able to loosen restrictions, hopefully in the near future, we will be faced instead with having to tighten them. We must not take that risk. So for that reason, my basic message for Scotland remains the same as it has been. Please stay at home except for essential purposes. I have made clear, however, that the Scottish Government will keep what constitutes an essential purpose under review. And I told you last week that we were considering making one immediate change, uh, a change to the guidance relating to exercise. And I can confirm that the Scottish Cabinet met earlier this afternoon and agreed a change to that guidance. At present, you're only permitted to leave home to exercise once every day. From tomorrow, that once a day limit will be removed. So if you want to go for a walk more often or to go for a run and also a walk later on in the day, then you can now do so. It is important to stress that this new advice will not apply if you or someone in your household has symptoms of the virus or if you received a letter explaining that you are in the shielded group. In those cases, the advice is still to stay at home completely and not go out at all. And for everybody, all other lockdown restrictions remain in place. When you are exercising, you must uh, stay relatively close to your own home. 
and at all times at least two metres away from people from other households. And although the rules permit exercise such as walking or running or cycling, they do not yet extend to outdoor leisure activities such as sunbathing, picnics or barbecues. The fact that you are allowed to exercise from tomorrow more than once is definitely not, and I want to stress this point, a licence to start meeting up in groups at the park or at the beach. Doing that really does risk spreading this virus and it could potentially force us to reintroduce stricter guidelines or toughen up the regulations and penalties in future. What we are confirming today is instead a small but I think very important change to one part of the lockdown requirements. Uh, we believe that it will bring benefits to health and well-being, particularly for people who live in flats and don't have access to private gardens and for children who I know will have found the once a day limit particularly difficult. But the most important point is this, it will bring those benefits without, in our judgment, having a major impact on the spread of the virus. However, and this is really important, the other basic principles and rules of lockdown remain for now the same. Unless you're doing exercise or performing another essential task such as buying food or medicine, you should stay at home. And you should not meet up with people from other households because that is how we give the virus a chance to spread, uh, give it bridges that it can uh, travel over um, and lead to increased spread. So the change that I have confirmed today is the only change that the Scottish Government judges that it is safe to make right now without risking a rapid resurgence of the virus. We do not, uh, at this point, want to see more businesses opening up or more people going to work. Uh, our guidance to business remains, for now, the same as it has been. And we are not yet changing who can or should be at school. Now, you may hear the Prime Minister uh, announce other immediate changes uh, for England uh, later tonight. And that is absolutely his right to do so. I have just come from a COBRA meeting uh, with the Prime Minister and the First Ministers of Wales and Northern Ireland. Now, it's important to say that I don't expect the detail of these immediate changes uh, that the Prime Minister will announce to be significant. And I predict that any differences with the position here in Scotland will be relatively minor. However, for the avoidance of doubt, let me be clear, except for the one change I have confirmed today, the rules here have not changed. We remain in lockdown for now, and my ask of you remains to stay at home. However, we will continue to monitor the evidence closely and make further changes as soon as we consider it safe to do so. And in the interest of openness and transparency and the grown-up conversation that I keep talking about that I want to have, I want to give you as much visibility of that as I can. So I'm going to share with you now uh, that over this coming week, as hopefully we will see more evidence of a downward trend in the virus, that we will assess further whether it is possible to extend the range of permissible outdoor activities that you can do uh, on your own or at a safe distance. We will also consider over the coming days whether garden centres can reopen and we will think about whether some additional forms of outdoor work, particularly where people work on their own or at a distance, can safely resume. And we'll be looking urgently in close discussion with councils at the possibility of reopening waste and recycling centres. And I will update you on these uh, further issues next weekend. Beyond that, of course, we will continue to consider when and how more businesses can safely start to reopen, what changes will be required to public transport, and when and how children can start returning to school. On that latter point, though, I do not expect that schools in Scotland will start to return as early as the 1st of June. Now, as well as announcing immediate changes, I understand that the Prime Minister will also tonight set out a longer-term plan uh, for England. The Scottish Government has not yet seen the full detail of this plan, so it's not possible for us to simply adopt it for Scotland. And indeed, the evidence may well tell us that moving at exactly the same pace is not appropriate. But we will consider it carefully and we will take our own expert advice on it. And as soon as possible, we will set out our own view on the phasing of a more substantial lifting of the lockdown. We're already working with businesses to produce guidance specific to the needs of industry, workers and public health in Scotland. Uh, we will publish that guidance sector by sector in the coming days and weeks. Our early priority is to give guidance and visibility to the construction, manufacturing and retail sectors. Uh, lastly, in areas which are the responsibility of the UK government uh, in Scotland, we will make sure that our views and concerns are known. For example, 
Uh, we expect confirmation uh, tonight of a period of quarantine for people travelling into the UK. Uh, I've made it clear that I believe this is vital to our efforts to contain the virus in the period ahead, and I uh, would encourage the UK Government to introduce that as soon as possible. Last me, lastly, uh, let me say something about cooperation between the four nations of the UK. I remain uh, committed to the closest possible cooperation, collaboration and alignment. And let me stress again, as I have done so many times before, I have no interest whatsoever in politics when it comes to tackling this virus. It is perfectly consistent with an overall Four Nations approach to have a pragmatic acceptance that we may move at different speeds if the evidence tells us that that is necessary. And I believe we do now have that acceptance. But genuine consultation and alignment of messages, even perhaps especially when the evidence is putting us on slightly different timelines, remains really important. We should not be reading of each other's plans for the first time in newspapers and decisions that are being taken for one nation only for good evidence-based reasons should not be presented as if they apply UK-wide. Clarity of message is paramount if we expect all of you to know exactly what it is we are asking of you. And as leaders, we have a duty to deliver that clarity to those we are accountable to, not to confuse it. To that end, I have asked the UK Government not to deploy their Stay Alert advertising campaign in Scotland. Because the message in Scotland at this stage is not stay at home if you can. The message is, except for the essential reasons you know about, stay at home, full stop. Fundamentally, we all have a responsibility, and it is a very heavy one for all of us, to make decisions and set policies based on our own data of what is safe and what is not. I am clear uh, as First Minister that for Scotland at this present moment, relaxing too many restrictions too quickly creates a real risk that the virus will take off again. And I am not prepared to take that risk. That is why, except for the fact that from tomorrow you can go out to exercise more than once a day, the current lockdown restrictions remain in place. I very much hope that it will be possible to lift more of them in the days and weeks ahead. And as I've set out already, we are making plans for that. But at the moment, the risks are still too great. For all of us, in fact, and this is an important point, the way in which we can emerge from lockdown that bit more quickly is to stick with the current restrictions now. It is easier for us to start leaving lockdown the lower the R number is and the fewer infectious cases there are. So please stay at home, except for when uh, you're buying food or medicines or exercising. Go for walks or runs more than once a day if you want to. It's good for your health and your physical and mental well-being. But stay more than two metres from other people when you're out and don't meet up with people from other households. Please wear a face covering if you are in a shop or on public transport and isolate completely if you or someone else in your household has symptoms. I know that these restrictions continue to be really tough and I know that hearing any talk about easing the lockdown actually makes them seem even tougher. But please, I am asking you to stick with it. We are making progress, never lose sight of that. But even as we stay in touch by phone, social media, by video calls, we still need to stay apart physically from each other. We still need to stay at home. By doing that, we will continue to slow down the spread of this virus. We will continue, as we have been doing, to protect the NHS, and we will save lives. So thank you once again to all of you uh, from the bottom of my heart for uh, what you have been doing. And please, for now, stay at home. I'm now going to uh, go to questions. I'm joined, uh, as uh, always, uh, or as usual today, by the Chief Medical Officer and the Health Secretary, who will, of course, uh, join me in answering questions. Uh, but in the interest of time, and because, as always, we have a long list of questions, I'm going to uh, go straight to those. So can I uh, start with uh, Ryan uh, Maher from STV? Scotland now have two different messages. Are you that this will cause confusion and could lead to people taking their own decisions and what rules to follow? And if so, how are you going to get the people of Scotland to adhere to your message? 
Well, our message hasn't changed. Uh, the message I'm giving as First Minister of Scotland is the one that you've heard me give every single day since we went into lockdown. Stay at home except for essential purposes. We slightly extended today what an essential purpose is. You can now exercise as often as possible. But the, the default uh, basic stay at home message uh, remains and the Scottish Government will take uh, all appropriate steps to make sure that that is known and understood. Um, from uh, what I can gather today from the First Ministers of Wales and Northern Ireland, that stay at home message remains there as well. I think it is really important, firstly, that I, and I do respect uh, the Prime Minister's right, or indeed the First Ministers of other nations, to take different decisions if the evidence says that that is appropriate in their uh, nations. It's really important that all of us try our hardest not to confuse messages. That's why uh, we've asked the UK government not to run its new advertising campaign in Scotland, because that would risk undermining the Scottish government's message, which is now at this stage uh, to stay at home. So I, I will keep saying it for as long as I consider it is necessary. I will not say it for any longer than I consider it necessary, but I judge it necessary now to advise people except for these essential reasons that you know about stay at home. That remains the advice in Scotland. Uh, Glenn Campbell from the BBC. First Minister, are you saying that people will die unnecessarily because the stay at home slogan has been dropped by the UK government? And given that there is now mixed messaging, are the Scottish and UK government still following the same overall strategy? Um, what I am saying is that I think there is a risk of people dying unnecessarily in Scotland if we were to drop the stay at home message, because the evidence I see says that we are still at such a fragile uh, state and the progress we've made is not yet far enough and not yet strong enough to change that overall message. Um, you know, the Prime Minister will look at the evidence in England and reach his own conclusions, and I absolutely believe that all of us are seeking to take decisions uh, that we think are right in the circumstances we face. So my advice and my conclusions and my messaging is, is for Scotland. Um, there is always a risk of mixed messaging if we are accepting that because of differential evidence we might be moving at a slightly different pace. I think we all do accept that that needs to be we need to have that flexibility. Uh, but that does not mean that we do not continue to cooperate and collaborate and align our messages as far as possible. And as long as we have an agreement that in each nation, uh, the, the government there is in the lead in terms of the, the messaging and that the communication of that message is respected, then I think we can have a four nations approach that we all respect, that allows for differences where the evidence says those differences are essential and we all communicate that message properly. And I hope very much that we, we can uh, do that. And, and I think for the Prime Minister, and I think it's a point he recognises, that he has to uh, be clear with people that some of what he is saying uh, applies to England and not to Scotland, Wales and, and Northern Ireland. There will be other things that he says around border control, for example, that applies for the whole UK. But there is a responsibility in all of us to be clear in our messaging and the applicability of that message. And if we all work hard to do that, then there's no reason why we cannot continue to give very clear messages to people in every part of the UK. Uh, James Matthews from Sky. Thanks very much indeed, First Minister. You, to be clear, though, you did say last week that to drop the stay-at-home message would be potentially catastrophic. Is the Prime Minister courting catastrophe? Um, look, the, the evidence... I, I am taking decisions based on the fact that I think our, our number may be a bit higher and it's not yet safe for Scotland to substantially change our position. It is for the Prime Minister to judge that evidence in England and come to his conclusions. So it is entirely possible that for our own uh, populations, we are both taking perfectly defensible and justifiable decisions. Uh, but I'm here to speak for the decisions I take as First Minister for Scotland. For Scotland right now, given the fragility of the progress we've made, given the critical point that we are at, then it would be catastrophic for me to drop the stay-at-home message, which is why I am not prepared to do it. Uh, and I'm particularly not prepared to do it in favour of a message that is vague and imprecise. I, I feel very strongly that, and, and it's a responsibility I bear uh, and feel very heavily, I'm asking all of you to do things right now that are not normal in everyday life. And therefore, I have a duty 
to be able to be clear to you about what my messages to you involve in terms of what you can do and what you can't do. Stay at home except for X, Y and Z. It's a clear message uh, and it's one that I think allows you to make the judgments about what you can and can't do, should and shouldn't do. I don't know what stay alert means. Presumably we all live our lives in normal times, staying alert to danger. Uh, but if I say to you, my message now is stay alert, and you say to me, but does that mean I stay at home or not? I, I can't give you a straight answer to that. And therefore I am failing in my duty to be clear in terms of, of what I'm asking you to do. Uh, so that's why stay at home is important in Scotland right now, and it's why I'm uh, going to continue for as long, but not any longer, than I think it is necessary to ask you to follow that advice. Uh, Phil McDonald from Global. Thanks, First Minister. You said on Twitter you only found out about the new stay alert message through the newspapers. You've had a chance to speak with the Prime Minister this afternoon. What reason did he give you as to why your government wasn't consulted and why has there been a breakdown in communication? Um, look, I, I think uh, the Prime Minister uh, is well aware of my view that reading of each other's plans in the newspaper for the first time is not a, a helpful or a sensible way to proceed. You know, we're not in normal times. This is not uh, a normal political issue. We're not in an election campaign. It's not detail about a budget or a program for government. This is information that is really, really critical to people's safety. And without exaggerating, these things are right now matters of, of life and death. So it's really important that we share uh, our thinking and share the decisions that we are making, albeit that we may make slightly different decisions at times. And I hope we move forward in a way uh, that respect that uh, rather than have a situation where I or any of the other First Ministers are seeing uh, a change in the guidance that the UK government is giving, even if it's just for England, uh, on the front pages of a Sunday newspaper. Uh, Craig Payton from PA. Thank you, First Minister. Uh, does a change in messaging from the UK government without any consultation with the other devolved nations make a four nations approach harder or even impossible to, to achieve? Um, also, what did the Prime Minister say when you asked them for the stay alert advertising campaign not to be deployed in Scotland? Um, on that latter point, there are uh, discussions between uh, communications uh, teams in the Scottish Government and the UK Government taking place uh, as of now, or they have been taking place over the last little while. So I am uh, confident that we will get that agreement um, and the, the Scottish Government will continue to make sure that the, the messages we want through our advertising are the messages you're reading in newspapers or seeing on the television or um, hearing on the radio. Um, in terms of... Uh, the wider point, I, th this is a, something I think that is, it, when we think through it, it's not too difficult. And I think we actually have agreement here. I, I am absolutely committed to a Four Nations approach, yeah, cooperating, collaborating, where we can, aligning our messages. The fact that we, for good evidence-based reasons, sometimes take slightly different decisions or take those decisions on a different time scale should not be seen as a breakdown in that Four Nations approach. It's perfectly possible to have a Four Nations approach that accepts for pragmatic reasons that we may sometimes do things slightly differently or on a slightly different time scale. What does make a Four Nations approach more difficult to sustain in the future is if decisions are being taken and... Uh, even inadvertently being presented as UK-wide decisions when they are not without proper consultation. And that, I think, is what is difficult and what I hope we will not see in the future, where we can get back to a position where we are sharing our thinking and, and coming to uh, views that even where we're doing things slightly differently, we understand each other's positions and don't, don't then inadvertently end up confusing each other's messages. Uh, Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Obviously, thousands of Scots will watch the Prime Minister's broadcast tonight, and this campaign will run uh, presumably on platforms such as Facebook, etc., where it may be very difficult to sort of screen out Scots seeing it. Um, is it actually possible to sort of sort of toss it off Scotland and prevent Scots from seeing the new stay, uh, the new advice down in England? And are you concerned that um, confusion will result from this? 
I'm, I'm not. Um, I, I'm a, sort of uh, enough of a veteran of, of media, uh, traditional and social, to know how these things work. I'm not going to be able to stop people in Scotland seeing uh, this uh, messaging. You know, people can see it on the front page of Sunday newspapers today. Um, but I'm treating the people of Scotland like the intelligent human beings that they are. And I'm saying you may see this, but hopefully you will not see it in blanket coverage because you will see the Scottish Government message. But I am telling you and uh, asking you to abide by the messages that the Scottish Government is given because we're giving these messages for really good reasons, uh, that we think they are the right messages right now to suppress this virus. And one of the, the reasons I, I stand here uh, pretty much every day and deliver these messages is because I just think it's really important that you hear it directly from me or from uh, the Cabinet Secretary and the, the CMO, what it is we're asking you to do and that we're as clear about that as, as possible. And, you know, most of us are quite media savvy uh, these days, so I think we can understand uh, these things. So let's not... Uh, Let's not overcomplicate this. Uh, people in Scotland, in terms of the advice that we are giving, listen to what the Scottish Government advice is and please follow that. If you live in England, you listen to the advice that the, the UK Government is given. If you live in Wales, you listen to the advice of the Welsh Government and similarly in, in Northern Ireland. So, you know, I think people are perfectly capable of understanding that. Uh, Michael Blackley from the Daily Mail. Hi, good afternoon. I appreciate that you are trying not to comment on decisions for England, um, but do you believe that the decisions that are going to be announced tonight could lead to an increase in infection rates in England, which therefore could have a consequential impact on Scotland's infection rates? Look, we, we all have to be very uh, conscious of the need to be uh, very cautious right now. Um, and of course, I've, as I've said before, the virus doesn't respect borders. So if, if the infection rate was to, to run out of control in one part of the UK, clearly that has implications for other parts of the UK. And I think that says we all have to be cautious. But if the evidence shows that certain things can be lifted in one part of the UK without risking uh, the virus running out of control again, then clearly governments in that particular part of the UK are, are entitled to make decisions uh, based on that. So, you know, my overall watchword here is, is caution, and I make no apology from that. I've just been reading uh, some material from Germany uh, that sh suggests that the transmission rate in Germany, as they've started to ease up things, has gone over one again. Now, I certainly can't comment in detail on the position in Germany, but, but what that tells us is that the, the margins for error here are really narrow um, and it doesn't take very much right now. It doesn't take many more social interactions between us, you know, between different households that are not mixing right now for that virus rate to start to increase. And that's why we have to be careful, uh, because if we go too fast right now, we risk all the progress we've made. I don't want to be in a situation here uh, where having asked you to, to be in lockdown for what, seven weeks now, that we get so impatient, and I get so impatient to tell you that I want to ease things up, that we squander all that progress and we end up in lockdown for a lot longer than would otherwise be the case. Uh, nor do I want, in a couple of weeks from now, us to be looking at a situation where the virus has run out of control again, and you, you are saying to me, why did you uh, not exercise a bit more restraint and caution? Why did you start to ease lockdown a bit too early? So I, I've said to you all along, these are really tough decisions. Uh, these are finely balanced decisions. There is no certainty um, about the impact of any of them. But in those circumstances, my duty is to be as cautious as possible, uh, to do as much as we can to continue to protect health and to avoid people dying unnecessarily. And that is what I'm going to continue to try to do. Gregor, do you want to say a bit uh, from your perspective about just the state of the evidence right now and, and the need for us to continue to be very cautious? Yeah, I'd be pleased to. I, I mean, at the moment, like um, other people, we've been watching very, very closely um, a, a range of data that allows us to track what the current picture is for this infection and the way it's transmitted across Scotland. So we've been watching over the last few weeks very closely the number of new cases every day, the number of new hospitalisations, both to general wards and to ICU, and of course the number of deaths. And, and what that tells us is, is that very slowly we're seeing a gradual decline in the number of those cases, and, and that's very encouraging. But, but I emphasise again, it's been a very slow decline. 
And when we use that data to try to calculate where we are in terms of both the number of new infections across the country, but also this all-important R number, what I have to say is that there's insufficient confidence at this point in time to say that we're sufficiently below that magical one number to be able to say that any significant change in the restrictions that we're all enduring just now wouldn't lead us back into that exponential growth. And that's the real danger here, is, is that we relax things too early, make the changes too significantly, that the message begins to change and that, that our number begins to grow. And of course, from that, the number of cases begins to grow, the number of hospitalizations begins to grow, and ultimately the number of deaths begin to grow again. So what we need to do to make sure that we are very, very cautious in our approach just now is till we have sufficient confidence that we have sufficient headroom to make sure that any changes that we make don't impact on that overall overall rate of growth. I want to briefly bring the Health Secretary in at this point to talk about our work on test, trace, isolate, because the other factor here, which you've heard us talk about before, that as we do start to ease restrictions, and, and any easing of restrictions will have an impact on the R number, but the lower your baseline, the more headroom you've got to cope with that. But the more important it is that you have the, the test, trace, isolate infrastructure in place to identify any outbreaks and try to suppress them straight away. So I, another really important part of what we're doing right now is building very rapidly that capacity and capability for test, trace, isolate. Uh, and I'll ask the Health Secretary just to say a, a few brief words about the work on that front. Thanks, Mr Minister. So there, there are uh, a number of elements to uh, creating the delivery of a test trace isolate strategy. Uh, ramping up our testing capacity, uh, we will be at 8,000 tests per day in NHS labs uh, by the middle of this week, but we need to increase that.
That is the work that we are working very hard on with our directors of public health, our local primary care teams, and of course, in consultation with Scottish Care. Thank you. Alistair Grant from the Herald. Hi there, thanks very much. Uh, the SNP MP Angus McNeil has suggested Scotland's border with England should be policed if lockdown measures are lifted down south. Uh, just to quote him, he said, for the good of both populations, the Scottish border should be policed for day trippers or those whose trips are non-essential if the English decide they want to ease up. Are these comments something you would agree with? Uh, and is any kind of policing presence at the border something the Scottish Government has considered if further divergence occurs? I've not seen uh, those comments. I've been, uh, as, as you can imagine, a bit busy uh, today. The Chief Constable was standing here on Friday and you know, explained the situation around the border. He used the example, for example, uh, of uh, different drink drive limits that already exist south of the border and north of the border. So the police are perfectly um, used to uh, policing in a, an appropriate way uh, along the border. I would, I would stress that I think, although we have to wait and see, I would think the in, in the detail of the positions between uh, Scotland and the rest of the UK uh, as of tonight, uh, the differences will be minor. Um, obviously, uh, we will see how things develop, but all of us have to be guided uh, by the evidence and, and we you know, have to, to look at uh, the implications of that as we go. But as I've said before, um, neither the government or the police have any uh, plans to change the current situation uh, around policing of the border or any other part of the country. Um, Chris Musson from The Sun. Hi, First Minister. Um, can you share your evidence with the public about the transmission rate, given this is shaping your policy? Can you be clear about how this all-important R number is calculated? Dr Smith there suggested deaths was a factor, but what is it in the community what is it in care homes and hospitals? Because if it is far higher in care homes and hospitals, how can you assure the public that we're not being kept indoors due to an inappropriate broad brush policy caused by the overall rate being skewed by these institutions? Well, firstly, um, we will look to see what more we can publish. We want to be as transparent as possible. We have now published two documents that gives uh, a lot of our thinking and a lot of how we are, uh, of what we are basing that thinking on. Uh, we uh, cannot yet say, certainly this is what the experts uh, say to me, exactly what the R number is in care homes, not least because it's not a uniform picture across care homes. We still have roughly half of all of our care homes in Scotland that have had no cases of the infection at all. We have others that have had obviously very high uh, rates of infections and sadly a high number of deaths. I would caution you against seeing though what happens in care homes as isolated from what happens in the community. There will always be um, an interaction between the two, just as there will be an interaction between infection rates in hospital and in the community, as particularly staff will, will come, will go from uh, a place of work into the wider community. So these things are more interlinked uh, than you might think is the case. But we will uh, continue to be as open and transparent about not just the decisions we're taking, but the evidence base of these decisions as we can be. Do you want to add anything, Gregor? I think all I would say, just in addition to that, is that, is that with the data that, that we have in this country, it is um, it is impossible to state with any degree of confidence at all. The, the, the modelling groups have looked at this quite extensively. At this point in time, it's impossible to state with any degree of confidence what separate our numbers might be for either um, hospitals or, or, or care homes. And, and what we have is is the best estimate of the R number for the, the, the country as a whole, which includes all those three aspects. Vivian Aitken from the Daily Record. What is that number then? Can, we, can, we, can you tell us that number? Well, I think I, several times now, Chris, I've said to you, I can't tell you that number because the experts tell me it's not possible to say with certainty what that is. If I do get told what that number is, just as we have done for the, the R rate or the estimate of the R rate in the community, I will share that with the public. I'm trying to take as open an approach to this as possible, but I'm not simply, I'm not ever going to stand up here and just you know, give you numbers that are not solidly based, however much you, you might want me to do that. So I'm telling you, and I've told you a number of times before, that I cannot give you that number right now. It's not that I don't want to give you, it's because I'm not able uh, to give you that in a, a properly, solidly evidence-based way. Uh, Vivian Aitken from The Daily Record. Question, First Minister. Um, 
Last week, you said that the leaked change to newspapers, all of all those details, the thing that gave you the most concern was this change in messaging. And you said that after your conversation with the Prime Minister, you sort of indicated that you were on the same page for messaging. Has the Prime Minister done a complete U-turn since your telephone call? Or is the Scottish or is the UK government treating the people of Scotland and her Prime Minister with contempt and, and is the Prime Minister just saying what he thinks people want to hear at any given point of time? Look, um, I, I'm not, I, I appreciate that valiant attempt to put some provocative words into my uh, mouth there. I'm, I'm going to resist uh, that temptation because I've said all along, this is not a normal, it's not a political situation at all. So, um, you know, the kind of rhetoric backwards and forwards between politicians that might be appropriate at normal times is just not appropriate right now. I, I only care about all of us trying to take the right decisions to, to, to tackle this virus as, as best we can. Um, I you know, heard the Prime Minister last week, I heard him again today say that stay at home remains an important message. Um, the, the question in my mind is how that fits with the change in the, the campaign that we've seen reported in the Sunday papers today. But since I am not proposing to make that change here in Scotland, I think it is probably better for me to leave it to the Prime Minister to explain how a stay-at-home message fits with uh, dropping a stay-at-home message for, for, for England. Um, I will continue to articulate the message that I want to give to you the people of Scotland, which is to stay at home except for the essential purposes. Because what I said last week, and again, I'm talking for Scotland based on the evidence as I see it, to move away from that right now, to muddy the waters, to give people mixed messages and effectively leave people not really understanding what it is we're asking you to do and not do would be potentially catastrophic because it would lead to people perhaps uh, through no fault of their own, going out more than they should uh, or mixing with people more than they should. And that's the circumstances in which we would see a rapid increase in uh, the virus. So I will continue to articulate a message for Scotland that I think is the right one. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave it to uh, the Prime Minister to, as I'm sure he will uh, set out later on, uh, to, to, to say why he thinks that change of message for England is appropriate and will not run the risks that I have expressed concern about. Um, Severin Carroll from The Guardian. Good afternoon, First Minister. Uh, good afternoon, First Minister. Um, you say that you've asked the UK government not to use the new yellow and green uh, Stay Alert logo in Scotland. However, it will be visible in Scotland. It'll be on the UK broadcasters, TV. It'll be in UK newspapers and so on. Do you think that that logo needs a disclaimer? Have you sought or received guarantees that the UK government will make clear on that logo that it's supposed to be England only? Um, I have asked, not, not so, just to be clear, I've, I've not, we've not yet specifically, and we'll, we'll certainly consider whether this would be practically possible or sensible in any way, but I've not asked for the words for, for England only to be put on the logo. I have asked, and hopefully this will happen, for the Prime Minister to be very careful when he is uh, giving any messages or announcing any decisions where he is speaking for England only and uh, sort of uh, by contrast where he is speaking for the whole UK. So if he, as I would expect, announces uh, border control tonight, I accept that he will be speaking for the whole of the UK. But when he talks about lifting restrictions uh, in lock to lockdown, he is only speaking for England. And in terms of public health advice, uh, he is only speaking for England. And I think it is incumbent, just as I am being very clear, I am only speaking uh, for Scotland uh, when I say the advice is absolutely stay at home. Um, and I think we all have to take care to make sure that we are clear about that. And, you know, mixed messaging here is not inevitable. Um, many people I know are watching this update, watching the UK government's daily updates. Uh, people are perfectly capable of working out where they live and whose public health advice they should be following. Uh, the public are far more uh, intelligent than perhaps sometimes politicians uh, give you credit for. So we'll continue to work hard to make sure the message that we are putting across to people in Scotland is the one that people understand is that that they should follow. Uh, Muir Dickey from the FT. Thank you. Uh, you made the point that you would not want the UK government to uh, advert to use its uh, new stay alert uh, message in its advertising in Scotland. Just for clarity, would you want them to continue that advertising campaign but using the stay home message or would you rather they just stop doing their advertising at all? 
And on that, has the UK government given any response to your request on this? Um, we, as, as I said earlier, I don't know if you heard in response to the previous question, there was a, a communications meeting after COBRA, and I hope that agreement um, will have been reached in, in that meeting. Um, we have our own stay-at-home advertising campaign. I was just checking, you can see uh, an example of it behind me here. So uh, any advertising space that the UK government may have uh, secured in Scotland, uh, we can provide Scottish Government public health messaging for that, as we have been doing at points uh, previously. And uh, so the, the Scottish Government's public health campaign, which is very clearly still stay at home, uh, can be utilised for any uh, advertising space in Scotland. Uh, Kathleen Nutt from The National. Hello, Mr Minister. Professor Linda Bold was talking about the pausing of the cancer screening programme at Holyrood um, last week, and she was saying normally the programme screens something like 100,000 people a month. And um, have you any update about when the cancer screening programme will resume, and also if there's any plan to deal with the backlog? Well, I, I, I'm sure you you heard when we set out the the regrettable decision to have to pause the, the cancer screening programmes, uh, the reason for deciding to pause rather than try to continue them through this period. Uh, in response to part of your question, we are considering now how we uh, resume NHS procedures that have been paused. The Health Secretary can say a word about that in a moment, and that will include screening programmes. But the reason we decided to pause was so that nobody would miss out and that we could then uh, catch up with people. If we had carried on and somebody missed an appointment because maybe they had the virus or they were worried about going for their appointment in case it brought them into contact with other people, then what would happen by default is that they would then not get another appointment until the, the three year or five year or whatever the, the time scale of the, uh, the screening is. By pausing, uh, it means we can pick up where we left off so nobody should miss an appointment. Um, it will just be slightly later if, if you were due to be screened in this period than it would otherwise have been. So we will be able to catch up and deal with the backlog. And it was judged that that was uh, less of uh, a problem for people than carrying on and allowing people to completely miss their appointment in this cycle. Jean, do you want to say a word about uh, restoring and resuming NHS procedures? So a great deal of work is now underway to look at across the whole of the NHS from primary care right through to acute care about what might be possible in terms of restoring some of the areas that have been paused in order to allow us to be ready to deal with the pandemic. Uh, the important point, the two important points in this, one is that we need to be sure that we can retain a capacity to deal with COVID-19 cases, including if there is an increase in those cases, both in our bed numbers and also in our ICU numbers. Uh, and secondly, in looking at that work, we need to very proactively engage the widest possible clinical community about the views that they have. So uh, the CMO has been in touch with the Royal Colleges. I have spoken to the BMA and the RCN. We have uh, begun to alert the unions representing staff across our NHS so that we uh, understand all the views that are coming so we can make uh, what will nonetheless be uh, complex and at times difficult decisions about what it is possible to restart but what isn't possible to restart because of the impact that might have on our capacity to deal nonetheless with cases coming th as a result of the pandemic and into all of that will go the screening programs because we share the very strong view about the importance of those programs as preventative as well as uh, picking up uh, individuals who are beginning to show uh, signs that they might have cancer. So all of that will be factored into the mix and we will absolutely uh, be back making very clear to people the criteria we've used to make decisions, what the initial steps might be and then what subsequent steps might be. But before I finish the other point, I need to take this opportunity to make, of course, is to remember that the NHS is open it is open for urgent, for cancer, for emergency and for maternity. So if you have any of those uh, worrying symptoms uh, that uh, the CMO has described before, of course, if you have an emergency and if you are pregnant, then please be in touch with your NHS because it is there to help you right now. Thank you. Uh, Margaret, 
Gorkin from the Times. Hello there. Um, Jonathan Ashworth, Labour's Shadow Health Secretary, said this morning, locking down some bits of the country and not locking down other bits of the country doesn't work. When that approach was attempted in Italy, lots of essentially middle-class people went from northern Italy to southern Italy and took the virus with them. So if the R rate is higher in Scotland, are you concerned that England's message will be seen as some kind of green light to go for a jolly in the Lake District or something? And also, um, you said that um, the public is smarter than some politicians might give them credit for and can understand nuanced messages. So why can't we have different messages for different parts of Scotland? For example, Greater Glasgow, stay at home, Inverness, you can you know, go about your day in a slightly more normal way. If the evidence said that was uh, necessary and if we judged that that was practically deliverable, then I'd never ruled that out. But we are not at that stage at this uh, point. In terms of, again, I, I, forgive me, I've not seen John Ashworth's comments, um, but I also think it's really important we don't get ahead of ourselves here. I think what you're going to see for the next few days is minor differences between uh, the different countries of the UK in terms of what the, the detail of the lockdown restrictions are. We are not heading for a situation where Scotland's in lockdown and England is not. Um, and, you know, if, if we ever got to that stage, and I don't anticipate that we will get to that stage, um, then clearly you have more fundamental issues to try to resolve. But let's not overstate the, the degree of uh, detailed differences that we are likely to be looking at. What we are talking about here is the potential for uh, different nations of the UK going at slightly different paces because we are all potentially a slightly different stage of the, the infection curve that you all hear us talking about. So, you know, these are important uh, differences at times. We have to communicate them clearly. We've got to all of us avoid mixed messages and avoid undermining each other's messages. But equally, let's not exaggerate the, change, the, the differences that are likely to be in place. Uh, Derek Keeley from The Courier. Hi, First Minister, I wanted to ask you about that policy of allowing people out more than once a day and what kind of impact you would expect that to have on the transmission rate. Um, is it a case right now of kind of wait and see or do you have any specific projections you could share with us today? We expect the impact on the transmission rate to be uh, very, very minimal of this. Uh, I'll hand over to Gregor in a second. If, if we didn't think that, we wouldn't be doing this today. And the main reason in uh, overall terms, and this will be why over the next week we'll also consider whether other forms of outdoor activity may be uh, possible, is that while I am absolutely not saying there is no risk of outdoor transmission, because there is, so that's why keeping two metres apart from others, even outside, uh, avoiding you know, hard surfaces because you can pick the infection up there. But the evidence suggests that the, the risks of transmission out of doors are less than the risks of transmission when you are indoors, which is why uh, it is easier um, to lift restrictions outdoors than it is at the moment to lift them uh, indoors. And, and that's why we've uh, decided to make this one change today, because we think the risks to transmission are very low, but the benefits for people's health and well-being are potentially very significant. And I've uh, said before, it is a, a worry every single day of the other uh, impacts of what we're doing to tackle this virus. So the more we can relieve the pressure on people's well-being, the better, which is why I think this is a small change, but a potentially very important one. Gregor. So, so the epidemiologists, modelling groups, the, the, the analysts have, have looked at this very, very closely. It won't surprise you um, over, over the last few weeks, the impacts of different types of change in, in, in the restrictions that we have in place. And, and, and what they've assessed is, is that this particular one that we've announced today, to be able to go outside and to exercise um, more often, has, has very, very little impact on the actual transmission rates. But with one caveat, as long as people continue to um, observe the social distancing measures, the physical distancing measures, the hand hygiene, all these other things that we, we've stated are really, really critical all along. And, and, and as we look not only to our experience um, in, in, in other countries um, to, to see exactly how changes in their restrictions, what, what we constantly learn is, is that using the models that have been used elsewhere, using the data and the impacts that other countries have experienced as they start to change their restrictions, 
we begin to learn more and more about how we apply those models within Scotland and what impacts that might have on our population as well. Now, as I say, this is one where we know that there are real health benefits to being outside more often. We know that actually exercising outside is something which is beneficial not on, only in a physical sense, but, but actually it's good for our mental well-being as well. And so we've, we, we've judged, and I think it's a, it's a very fair judgment, that, that actually um, the, 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 the risk of going forward with this at this time, despite the fact that R is still fairly close to 1, is, is absolutely minimal. Thank you. And the last question today comes from Tom Magner from Carers World. Uh, thank you very much indeed, First Minister. A slightly different angle, if I may. The Dementia UK helpline is widely reported as having received an increase of 44% in calls. What assurance can you give that those with dementia, their carers, and the care homes in which some of them live will not get left behind or indeed forgotten in an exit strategy based on the needs of the economy and the wider population? It's a really important point, Tom, and I think uh, a, good, a good one to end on. I'm going to hand over to the Health Secretary to say a bit about the work we're doing uh, to make sure that the risk you have rightly pointed out doesn't materialise. It is a very important point, and I'm very conscious that the um, important restrictions that we have put in place in this lockdown, and particularly what we require to be happening in our care homes, uh, is causing a difficulty uh, of some considerable extent to people uh, who have dementia and to those who care for them. Now, we have, I think, in Scotland, uh, a very good dementia strategy overall, and we are now working with uh, Scottish Care and with those uh, advisors to see what more we can do so that there can be um, real uh, clinical risk assessments done that allow us to balance the need for infection prevention and control alongside uh, minimising and mitigating the distress that some of those measures are causing to people who have dementia and to those who care for them. And as we do that, we will, of course, work with the dementia organisations and uh, the carers involved to understand from them what would help them. We've already, as you know, introduced a number of practical steps, but I think there is, I know there is more that we can do and that work is underway to see how we can add to all of that to help individuals in those circumstances. Thank you uh, very much. Can I uh, thank all of the journalists for their questions today? Can I thank Gregor and Jean uh, for uh, joining me to help me answer the questions and uh, thank Rachel, our sign language interpreter today, for helping make sure this briefing is accessible uh, to everyone. Um, can I also thank all of you, not just for joining us today, but for continuing to uh, comply and to help us beat this virus. I I'm very conscious that as we go into uh, the next phase of tackling this virus, by necessity, our messages will become uh, more nuanced. That will be true within Scotland as we start to lift some of these restrictions, but it may also be true because, for very, very good reasons, different nations of the UK are moving at slightly different speeds. That puts an even greater obligation on our shoulders to stand here every day and as clearly as we possibly can tell you what it is we're asking you to do and why we are asking you to do that. And for now, the state of the evidence uh, leads us to believe that the progress we are making is real and significant but very fragile and that it would not take much right now to send the virus out of control again. I hope you agree with me that after everything we've all been through in these past number of weeks it would be uh, really, really, really wrong for us to take that risk and in the process uh, lead to a situation where more people die unnecessarily. So please stick with it for now. My very clear advice to people across Scotland is unless you are going out for food or medicine or to exercise now for as many times uh, from tomorrow for as many times a day as you want to, please stay at home. Uh, by staying at home, we are going to continue to get this virus under control. We'll continue to make sure that the pressure on our NHS doesn't increase and become overwhelming. And we will continue, notwithstanding the figures that I, again, have had to uh, communicate to you today, we will continue to save lives. So please, please continue to look at the Scottish Government advice and to follow that advice. Uh, we are not asking you to do these things for no reason. And let me stress again, I will not ask you to do any of this for any longer than is necessary. But please continue the good work you are doing because it is making 
a difference. Uh, we'll be back here uh, tomorrow at the normal time tomorrow of 12.30. And in the meantime, thank you all very much for joining us.